Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. This episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Zenium is supporting small and medium-sized organizations for their HR, payroll, benefits administration, compensation planning and design, and so much more. Learn more about Zenium at zeniumhr.com. Okay, today's episode is with Carolyn Bedreau. She started her career in the business world and then got so burned out that she took a year off, (laughs) traveled around the world, and came across an orphanage in India and completely changed her life. She ended up starting a nonprofit in May of 2000 after that point called the Miracle Foundation, and it's been going strong for 20 plus years. She's got 80 some employees. So we talk in this podcast about that moment where she decided to leave the private world, the business world and move to the nonprofit side. We talk about how employers can get involved and the employees can get involved in the community and what, what she recommends there and how we can really transform culture, the society, community, all that. And then I touch on growing a nonprofit, what that's like too. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this episode. It's a different type of episode, but I had a great conversation with Carolyn and enjoyed it immensely. So hope you enjoy it and talk to you next week. Caroline, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. You've got such a fascinating story. We had a chance to connect before this episode that we're recording today, but you run a very successful and a decent sized nonprofit and you're kind of flying all over the place, but that was not your life years ago. What's your story? How did you get to where you're at today? It was one of the best accidents I've ever had. I mean, really, I never planned to be where I am today. I was, uh, you know, I tell people I come from a small Catholic family, just the nine of us. Just the nine of you. Yeah, South Louisiana, I'm a Cajun. I had this wonderful family life, you know, and then went to college, then went to Austin, Texas, and started working in TV with some friends of mine. They had actually wired the satellites to the building. I mean, that's how small this TV station. We had like, you know, 15 viewers. It was awesome. And then, so I was in television. It was this kind of entrepreneurial. They were the engineers, made sure they went over the air. And I was back office sales, marketing. Which is like you grind it out in that space. I mean, you're burnout, burnout central. What I figured was, let me talk to franchises because, you know, you talk to one person and they have like 40 Taco Bells or one person have 25 Whataburgers. So that's kind of how we kept our little TV station going. And then we ended up getting bought by another television station kept part ownership in that, and then got bought by another TV station. It was a great, great career, but it was just getting more and more corporate. And I kept thinking the more zeros I had on my paycheck, the happier I would be. And I found out that that just really wasn't working. (laughs) Like, wait, I thought success equaled happiness. We are sold at bill of goods. We really are truly sold that it's all about the money. I, I And I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. So, you know, like you do in Austin, Texas, you go to happy hour with your friends and you get some margaritas and you start talking about your dreams. And one day my best friend and I decided we were going to quit our job and take a trip around the world for a year. That's incredible. And did you actually do that? We did it. We went back to her. We went stopped, stopped, got a bottle of wine, went back to her house, spread the world map on the floor and started picking the countries we wanted to see. But hold on. You, you wait, you quit your job before you did this? We decided we were going to do it. We went back to Chris's house, spread this map on the floor and started picking the countries we wanted to visit on this one year trip around the world. And the cool part was it wasn't like a two week vacation. So we could really see some of the world that you could never really get to with a two week trip. So she wanted to go to India because she'd been sponsoring a little boy there and she wanted to meet him. And I just said, Chris, oh my God, it's a scam. Oh, I'm so sorry. They give everybody the same picture. They saw you coming a mile away. You know, I I mean, I I just totally made fun of her about it, but she wanted to go and meet him. So we started, we quit our jobs. So fun. Quit our jobs, turned in our resignation, started our trip in January of 2000. 
started in South Africa and just worked our way up Africa. So uh, my friend and I uh, got to India in May of 2000. It was 119 degrees. We ended up in this state called Odisha. It was on the eastern side. And we went to this really remote village, 45 minutes off a paved road. We get out of the car. We get paraded through this village. And at the end of this parade is this little boy that's holding the first picture she'd ever sent. He was real. I I couldn't. He was real. So you were proved wrong. Totally proven wrong. It was just unbelievable. And we started doing volunteer work there every day. And one day, um, it was Mother's Day in the United States. It was the day that changed everything for me. Everything changed on May the 14th of 2000. I got up early in the morning and called my mom. I went to this village and worked in the 119 degree heat all day. Yeah, the joke is everything in India is hot except the showers. Or it was back 21 years ago. (laughs) But um, went and worked in the village all day and then went to this local's house for dinner. And we, we opened the gate and we walked in the door and we were greeted by 110 orphan children. The whole time I was in the village, I I was thinking to myself, wow, this is the bottom of the pyramid. This is the people we hear about. And then I walk into this orphanage and I see these 110 little children, these, these bald, dirty, empty looking, hungry children. I just was not at all prepared for that. So we had dinner with them. We had a beautiful prayer service with them. And then after dinner, we were just playing with them and holding them. And we were calling them Velcro babies because they would just attach to us. I mean, we're these total strangers and that we just can't put them down. They won't, they won't let us put them down. And this little girl came and put her head on my knee and I picked her up and I started singing the lullaby that my mother used to sing to me. You know, this this baby girl is just pushing her body into me until she finally just falls asleep. And I walk into her room. And I, I have to put her in her crib, and I see these, these wooden beds, these 30 wooden beds like picnic tables. And, you know, I put this hungry orphan girl on this picnic table. I mean, I heard her bones hit that bed, and I just changed. Mm. Yeah, because this was not your world at all. And so you were, like, in shock in a, in a way. I'm around the world, and they don't have a mom or a dad? Unacceptable. And so, you know, I started the Miracle Foundation that very day. I just knew, I saw the human potential in their eyes. I knew that they might cure cancer one day if we gave them a chance. These, these kids might be, you know, our future if we just gave them a chance. And so um, I started the Miracle Foundation that very day because I knew that they were miracles and I knew that they needed a foundation. And so that was 21 years ago. You know, I started going to all these different orphanages in India. We finished our trip, by the way. So we kept going and we finished. I was totally haunted by what I saw there, but I knew I needed some time and just I needed to think and I needed to pray and I needed to figure out what I wanted to do to help the problem. But I was committed. I had made a decision that I was going to do something to help those children because I knew that, well, I thought, you know, if I didn't do it, who was going to do it? And so um, we finished our trip and then I decided I was going to do something to help the children went back to India and visited 26 orphanages on that second trip. In, in India or in different parts of the world? All in India. And that's when the idea of a franchise model came about. I thought, why are they all running so differently? They all need the same things. Where are the processes? They all have the same chart of accounts. They all pay house mothers. They all buy food. They all pay for pencils. Right. Why is the chart of accounts different in every orphanage? And where are the processes for child protection? And why are they running ad hoc? And so we, we found something called the Convention on the Rights of the Child. If you've never heard it, it is about it. It is an awesome document that was written in 1989 by the United Nations, ratified by 193 countries around the world. And we've all agreed that all children on all continents have the same fundamental rights. And if you give kids those rights, they can reach their full potential. And so we developed a model based on those rights, and we started implementing it into orphanage after orphanage after orphanage. We had 300. Wow. Were they welcome? Like you were bringing in these processes from the outside and just some like organization around this and they were, were they receptive to that idea? Yeah. You know, what was interesting is what we did was like any good company, we came up with a series of metrics. Like here's how you know if, if every child has the right to healthcare and nutrition, here's how you know if you're meeting that right. You take the height and weight of every child, you take the hemoglobin of every child and you plot it. And what happened was we would take these measurements for these orphanages 
and they would be shocked how they did. They would be shocked at how poorly they actually thought that they were doing a pretty good job. They were certainly doing the best they could, some of them. But once you gave them the score and you kind of started teaching them how to get a better score, they were some of them were interested. We ended up with um, working with about 300 orphanages across the country of India. In 2016, um, I went on a listening tour and I started talking to the children and visiting with the children because, of course, one of their rights is the right to a quality education. So they were learning English. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I learned then that not one of them wanted to be there. Not one of them. Really? They had a grandmother or an aunt or a cousin or a sister that could take them. I learned that if we were supporting the families, they're there because that's where the money was going. If the money was going to their grandmother and they could live with her, that would be the ideal. It'd be also be about one tenth of the cost. Yeah. So we, we shifted our, our model in 2017 and started working on family care. And our goal really is a family for every child. Our goal is to empty those 300 orphanages. We don't want orphanages anymore. We want children to be in family. Yeah. So why the shift to 2017? So 17 years go by. Yeah. And then you shifted here. So what was the precipice of that? Well, you know, like the corporate world, you have to change. You have to pivot. As long as your mission and vision stay the same, as long as you want to empower children to reach their full potential, you know, your, your strategy's got to change. So our strategy just changed. Our, our mission is to empower children to reach their full potential. And we learned, wow, they are not going to reach their full potential in an institution. So we got to get them out. Mm-hmm. Incredible. It's so interesting because you went from this corporate world to then just shifting all of a sudden to this nonprofit world. Do you sense that there's a lot of people out there like you where they're just so burned out with just the grind of business, but yet they need to give back in some way or that there's something more fulfilling in their life or, I mean, there's something that just inside you just came out and it was probably there all along, but it took this moment back in 2000 where you see this orphanage and and then just the best parts of you came out, you were touched. And I feel like there's a lot of people out there that are grinding it out in the business world that, man, if they just were able to give back in some way or get involved in the community, they would probably feel the way you're feeling. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we really all want the same three things. We want to love and be loved. We want our families to be healthy, happy, and taken care of. And we want to make a difference. Those are the things that we all really want. And then we go for the money and money can't buy those three things. We end up going for what everything money can buy, but what money cannot buy, you know, it can't buy our love. It can't make our families healthy, happy, and taken care of. And it can't give us that difference that we all want to make. So yes, I think that what happened to me was just an awakening. And yes, it's in all of us that we all want to make a difference. And for people that can't, shift their life and start a nonprofit or, you know, I don't even recommend that. Believe me, it is, you know, it looks all pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into that part too, in a little bit, just <laughs> <laughs> failure, you know, I mean, lots of failure, but like people can get involved in your nonprofit, you know, like you did the hard work of establishing it and, I mean, being an employer and all that stuff, like all the stuff that comes with it, but like people can get involved with you and other organizations like you. And, and listen, it's time. I mean, it's time. Yeah. I don't know where the sense of urgency is. It needs to be there. People are really suffering. Things have gotten better, but there's a really great opportunity for us to fix some of these humongous problems. And we really can do that. We really can do it. In the nineties, AIDS was the bubonic plague of our time. And we came together and we fixed that. You don't have to die of AIDS anymore. There are these things that we can do where in 1983, there were about 40,000 people on the planet dying of starvation a day. Today, there's 2 billion more people on the planet and 8,500 are dying of starvation. So it's not like that's good, but compared to 40,000 people, but compared to you, right. we're doing some pretty good stuff. But look, nothing's heavy if everyone lifts and not everyone is lifting. Love that. It's interesting. So I'm like, I'm not a big government guy. Like I just, I don't love when resources have to run through the government for for stuff. But I love when, because the businesses and the people who are very powerful, and very wealthy, they have the resources and the wherewithal to spread these resources in a way and, and allocate the resources. Like you're saying, people come together and they solve these incredible problems. Whereas if you just rely on governments to fix these problems, I just don't think it's going to happen as fast. So here you are, you're in the business community and then you 
shift over here and you know how to run a nonprofit, you know how to scale, you know how to fix some of these problems. I think there's more people out there like you that should get into this. How do we unlock that? Well, there's there's several things. You know, I can just tell you right away. Number one, we have to focus on the people and the planet. We have some issues now. I love so many of the arts. I love so many of animals. I, there's a lot of things, you know, tennis. There's, I mean, there's things that people donate to. But at the end of the day, right now, if we focus on people and the planet, and I mean, when I mean people, I don't mean giving to Harvard. Underprivileged is what you mean. I mean fixing inequality. That means we're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm. And some people have yachts and some people have canoes and some people are drowning. We have to help the drowning people. Figure out what your book looks like and then act accordingly. And so if we all focused on people and the planet until the year 2030. I'm talking about till 2030. If we all did that, number one, if we all got behind a nonprofit and gave 10% of our income to those nonprofits that are focusing on people and the planet, and if you gave to those nonprofits monthly, by the end of 2030, by the end of the decade, we would have some of these horrible problems fixed. I bet. I'm curious because you run a nonprofit. Is money donation, so you're saying 10%, or is time donation a better, or is it both? You need like kind of a mixture of like both donating time and getting help. Let me shoot straight with you on the time thing. Let me shoot straight with you. Yeah, please do. As a leader, volunteers are about the flakiest group of people. I mean, love them. It's hard to coordinate them, right? If they don't show up. When someone calls you and says, I can't come in today because my mom's in town. I mean, you know, and that's what volunteers have the right to do and the freedom to do. That is not a way to run a business. These are very difficult problems. These are very complex problems. And so we can't depend on, you know, we have to hold people accountable. We have to rely on experts. We need to be using master's degree of social workers and real people that are educated for teaching. So, you know, time is okay. And I know that feels good. I know that feels good to us. But really, money is the engine. And then we can hire the experts to truly do the work. That's a, that's a good point. The reason I was thinking about it is because, uh, so like in, you know, I'm in the HR industry and, and a lot of em- employers are really trying to build out community-based programs because it's like, it can be a team building thing, but also it's just part of their mission or whatever is to give back to the community as well. I mean, people, when they're, when they're choosing an employer to go work for, they want to now work for employers who are doing good in the community. And so that's why I was just asking them like, you know, if an employer can rally a group of employees to go volunteer and it's a volunteer day and you know, hold them accountable versus they're not going to flake out, like, you know, is that a good model as well? The other thing that's really shifted in the sector is that we really have to get to root cause. If I'm walking down the street and I see a baby drowning in the river, anyone is going to jump in the river and save the baby. That's what you're going to do. And that's relief work. And, you know, he's like, and then you get so busy saving the babies. You're, you're in the water. You see another baby and then another baby and another baby. And you're, you're so busy saving the babies that you never look up at the bridge and see the guy throwing the baby. Mm. And so really getting to root cause, why are they entering the system in the first place? What is going on there is not something you fix when you get a group of nice volunteers yeah. doing something a day. It doesn't really fix the problem. And, you know, I I appreciate getting to talk to you because, you know, if somebody calls me and says, I have $25,000, can my group come and volunteer for the day? I'm going to say yes. But the fact is, that is not how you fix a problem. That is not a sustainable solution. And there's some kind of like egocentric feedback loop that we all just really want. And jumping in the river and saving the baby does feel good. Yeah. But what you really want is you want to hire people to fix that guy at the top of the bridge. That's what you really want. I totally get that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that because I think, you know, a lot of listeners of this podcast, they probably have done the corporate community service days. I mean, we've done that at Zenny where, where I'm employed and, you know, it does feel good because it's a team building thing, but it's also like you feel like you're doing something. But I like what you're saying just about like, you know, the money is the driver. You can hire the right people, the right minds to fix these deep problems. Hold them accountable. You know, if one of my employees calls me, I mean, doesn't show up a couple of times, you know, I hold that accountable. I can't do that with a volunteer. That is true. Yeah. If they're employed by you, then. Yeah. They got KPIs, man. Right. I know. So give me some perspective. What is it like growing a nonprofit? Because you went from zero employees to, I think you have 70 or something like that now. Is that right? I think we have 83 now. 83. Incredible. 
Yeah, it's been hard, you know? I mean, it's been hard. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, how do you find the talent? You know, like, do a lot of people want to come work for nonprofits? A lot of people want to work for nonprofits. Yeah, they do. But, you know, you have to run a nonprofit like a company. That is, at the end of the day, first of all, they're gargantuan. They're gargantuan problems. Children separated from their families, gargantuan problem. And so hiring the right people is is really critical. And hiring people that look like the children that you're serving, hiring people that speak the language of the children that you're serving, hiring people that are in the community of the children that you're serving, that, again, kind of goes to the volunteer thing. It's like you want to hire people that are in the local community that have the trust of the children, have the trust of the families, have the tr- you know, mm-hmm. that, that's another big part of it. it it's interesting you, you said run it like a business. And I know why you say that. When people are donating money, they want to know that the most amount of money is going to the problem. And there's a lot of nonprofits out there that are not run efficiently. And if I'm donating $1,000 and only 50 of it actually makes <laughs> makes it to who I'm actually donating to and the rest of it goes to administrative fees or whatever's happening in the organization that's just run inefficiently. Like, I, so I can see why you say that. It's got to be run like a company. And like, here's the thing. You know, we, we all know that we want a certain percentage going to the constituency. Totally get that. But the real question is this. The real question is, is it working? Because if 99% of your money goes directly to the people, but there's no one to make sure that the people are actually benefiting from it, then you got a problem. You know, that, that second question of, is it working, is the one that's really missing. And I think that's why we've been so successful, because we created those measurement tools so that we can actually show not just the donors, but the children. You know, it was so funny because we, we used to tell the kids, you need to gain this much weight to be able to get on this growth chart. You know, this is what you need to do. They took it so seriously, Brandon. You no, know, they're the ones that want the metrics. They're the ones that want to know how they're doing. That's amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We could take this conversation in a thousand different directions. What am I missing about this? What else do you want to share about whether it's running a nonprofit, the people inside of it, how people can get involved? Like what? What else do you want to talk about? Yeah, I I want to encourage your listeners. It is a critical time. It's a pivotal time in our life and really in society. During coronavirus, the rich took one step up and the poor took one step down. Inequality got greater during coronavirus. And I really do liken what I wanted to tell your listeners to the storm. There is a storm and we're all in it. And you really need to act appropriately to what boat you're in you know, figure out, can you make, you know, and by the way, I never met anybody that was given 10% that missed it. It really, if if you just try it and go for it, I promise you, you will get rewarded in different ways. I'm I'm telling you, there's this karma thing. And I say 10% because there's a lot of religions out there that say 10%. So that's just kind of got it from that. But if everybody gave 10% to the people or the planet and gave it monthly, I'm telling you, we could fix these problems. Yeah. I love it. Where can people learn more about you, your organization, or anything that you're up to? Where can they follow you at? Yeah, follow us. We're at miraclefoundation.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. You can just you can find us. It's really easy to find us. Miracle Orphans and Miracle Foundation. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Caroline. I loved it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to your listeners for listening. <laughs>